the biggest challenges that that seniors face are um, there's no holistic solution mm. and there's a lot of health inequity. I'm Logan Plaster, and I'll be your host for this session. Without further ado, let's meet our guest for today, Mary Furlong. Mary's been a longtime friend of Startup Health, uh, but when she was recommended to me for this session uh, by Victor Wang, CEO and founder of Care.Coach, he told me that Mary knows everyone who matters in age tech, and they know her. That reputation didn't come overnight. Mary has been a trailblazer in this industry for more than 30 years. She's raised more than $300 million in the space and helmed three companies. She was named one of the top 100 women in Silicon Valley and received the first ever Lifetime Achievement Award given out by Aging 2.0. Mary could teach an entire semester on this topic, so we're incredibly fortunate to have her with us for the next hour. Um, and she could help us help startups understand how to survive and thrive in the age tech market. So welcome, Mary. Thanks for joining us today. I want to start with just the, cat the category. In my intro, I used the term age tech. I used senior innovation. Um, how do you think about defining this market that you've known so well? And how much do categories and names matter? Oh, gee. Well, when I, when I started... Uh... I, I went to uh, see the head of the Venture Capital Association, and I think this is relevant to your audience, uh, Dick Kramlick, and I said, I want you to judge our business plan competition. It was 21 years ago. And he said, well, we really don't, we have health tech companies. We don't really focus on aging. But then he said, wait a minute, when I look at what our health tech portfolio companies do, um, most of them are serving the needs of older adults. So through the years, you know, I was the founder of SeniorNet. I was the founder of Third Age Media. Um, there was some controversy about being called seniors. There was some controversy about being called third agers. And globally, it's different. Like seniors okay in Europe, whereas third age is viewed as the fourth age. Um, at the time we created Third Age, seniors didn't want to be called seniors. So now we evolved from saying the boomer summit to the longevity summit. So okay. I like to use the longevity market and I like to size that market as 9.6 trillion as does ARP and age tech. Um, and then say there are riches in the niches in the market. And that seems to be the most quotable quote around that. But what makes me excited about the market is that I'm 75. In a year and a half, the boomers are going to be 80 at the top end. So the longevity market around healthcare, when the boomers are in their 80s, is just ripe with opportunity. Yeah. So I, I think, I like to think of it as the longevity market. It's a global marketplace. How do you draw boundaries around the longevity market, given how multifaceted it is, just how huge it is? And is it helpful to kind of know what's what it is and what it isn't? Yes. And so, you know, most of the innovations, and we just had our sold out uh, venture summit in San Francisco with more investors and more participants than ever before. Um, and we looked at the, and we did analysis of the business plan competition submissions, healthcare was probably 85%. So I would say, yes, FinTech is a big market. Yes, travel is a big market. Housing is a big market. But healthcare and caregiving are going to dominate the market. A quote I heard at the conference is that uh, caregiving today is where AI was five years ago. So you can't go to a cafe that you don't hear a conversation about mm. caregiving. And so as that the different generations cope with the challenge of opportunity of caregiving. That's just another big market inside an already big market. Um, I also think travel and passion and play are also things. I think dating is a big market. So romance, this is a group that changed brands their whole life. 
they bought the Mustang, they bought the hula hoop, they're going to change their marital brand too. And so you're about to see a whole bunch of new innovations around play and adventure and aging mm. and dating and music. Interesting. Very interesting. So on this call, we've got dozens of problem solvers, healthcare problem solvers. So I want to hear from you directly, and maybe there's some learnings directly from the summit that you just had in June about what you think are the biggest challenges in the health on the healthcare side that need to be solved for today's seniors. The biggest challenges that, that seniors face are um, there's no holistic solution hmm. and there's a lot of health inequity. Um, and it's sort of like they forgot to take care of themselves. The boomers were raising kids, they traveled, they navigated adopting new technologies, and now they get to a point where, oh, it's time to go to water aerobics after you go to physical therapy, after you have a senior uh, fitness class. So it's sort of like... Uh, Staying healthy as they age is, is a big opportunity. And also the health systems and the reimbursements are really a challenge. So the biggest challenge I see entrepreneurs face is how to figure out how to reach the customer. Mm. And, and that changes all the time. So the rock star at our conference in June was Greg Olson from the Strait of New York who runs aging. And two weeks after our conference, he had... 22 startups pitch 40 different county leaders in New York, and many of our companies are getting traction in state governments, sometimes 12 state governments. But some of you might have seen the new news that Gina Bike, who was at CDW and um, then at Amazon, is the new head of AOL. 28 million people on AOL. So yeah. I know companies going direct to consumer through AOL, through Earthlink, through Yahoo, as the pattern of older adults spending time online is large. So you need a seven part strategy to go to market mm. to reach this consumer. Uh, maybe maybe you could give us a snapshot of, you said there was a that pitch competition reaching uh, folks in New York. What was sort of rising to the top uh, at the summit and in that pitch competition? What were you seeing that really kind of stood out? Well, the People's Choice Award went to Carriaya, which is a brilliant company that's using um, P PTs and OTs and medical students from around the country to serve as caregivers. Um, uh, what, the, what, what did you like about that their approach? Well, I love their approach because um, the people that are doing caregiving are dedicated people who want to learn about healthcare. Plus, his business model is rather unique. Um, they've got champions with angel investors all around the country who are doctors and others who believe in the cause and are investing in the company. So he's really got an interesting investment strategy. I mean, one of the things that came out of our conference, there's more investment going into this market than ever before. And it's coming from different segments, the nonprofit sector, the for-profit sector, the growth stage sector, the angel sector. And so I've never, I liken the moment we are today as when the internet came about in 1997. Hmm. That is the where the longevity, we're at that critical moment for longevity today, as okay. we were when, I mean, one of the things I thought was really interesting, I saw an article that said, MBAs coming out of uh, graduate school want to go and buy boomer startup companies rather than go work for somebody else. So they're mm. looking for these exit strategies of the boomers. Um, of the companies that they've built. And so there's just a tremendous amount of innovation and entrepreneurship, but building a company is hard, yeah. really hard. And I think what I see with the leaders in the space, Posit Science, Ageless Innovation, um, Victor, Care Coach and others, you know, they've had to try a lot of different ways to go to market. So, if you look at Posit Science, I spoke to them yesterday, they're in market through health plans, they're in market through YMCAs, 
and they're in market through the military. So at our conference in December at the National Press Club, we're going to have the military partners there at the table. So a lot of the innovations that help with aging also help with people in the military. You've mentioned the idea now twice, the idea of a, a roll-up, a holistic approach, a one-stop shop. Um, that can be challenging for a startup. We've got you know small, scrappy, smart companies trying to solve pieces of the challenge. Um, so what are your thoughts about the role startups can play in a world where you're right, there needs to be a roll-up, there needs to be a holistic solution? I want to I want to go back and say what are the seven areas where I think startups in healthcare need to know a strategy to go to market because that kind of answers the question. Cool. So if you can figure out how to go into home care, now there's five or six major home care agencies and the rest are mom and pop, but you need that strategy. You need a nonprofit strategy because now there are now funds like Volunteers of America as a fund that will fund you, but also apply their network to your distribution. Um, you need a senior housing strategy. And that's been difficult times in terms of how to get into senior housing. You need a GPO strategy, group purchasing. You need a retail strategy. You need a digital strategy. And you need a global strategy. And I don't know if that's seven or eight. But um, what I see happening COVID or during COVID, government funding, we're saving these nonprofits, saving the startup companies. And the, the government funds move faster than the other funds. And so, and you have to have an eye on the reimbursement. You have to know about that. And you have to know what the reimbursement and whether you should be chasing that money or not. I can oh, yeah. give you an example of two companies. Yeah, do it. Yeah, so there's one, SingFit, some of you may know, but they have been very successful in the UK. And then another company I knew, Balanceware, that had a solution for mobility, which is a huge category. You know, everyone could just start in creating companies around mobility. But <clears throat> they were able to get uh, counties in Denmark, because if if uh, people didn't fall, then you know that was less money to the government system if they didn't fall. So they were able to get contracts for the innovation at the county level. So one of the things you have to really be aware of is the demographics. So if you go to Ultrek in the Netherlands, it's a community that has a very high proportion of older adults. Same thing in Japan and Korea. And so you really have to think about, um, are there government programs in other parts of the world that would underwrite your innovation? We work very closely with CABI in Canada, the Canadian Brain Health Association. That's a great place to launch and test and fund your business. In fact, I'm now on the investment committee. You've in this call so far, you've mentioned things like the YMCA and county governments and the VA. I mean, the theme I'm hearing here is get creative about your go to market strategy, get creative about how you reach customers. Absolutely. And places that you would say, let's not go to Florida in July because it's hot and humid. But if all of the area agencies on aging are meeting in July in Florida, I bet I have 10 clients in Florida walking around because what happened is everybody got the memo about innovation. So now they're thinking about how can our organization leverage these technologies? So a lot of it is local. Libraries are a great way to reach older people. Um, Vivid Picks uh, does a lot of work in libraries. And I think libraries are going to be more and more important in the future as a place to disseminate innovation. I used to be in the Clinton administration. Um, we often said Clinton won, right? But I was in the Clinton administration as an advisor on internet and libraries. And now that I'm older, I see how many people use the resources of the library as a public information resource, you know. Let's talk a little bit about the NIA, the National Institute on Aging. 
Um, I think in our conversation, uh, you mentioned that there's a strong percentage of funding coming out of NIA that has your fingerprint on it at some level or another. And so you know it very well. Uh, can you give us a little bit of a primer on the NIA, how to startups, what they need to know, how they can be better positioned to raise funding there? Oh, it's been a brilliant initiative led by Todd Heim. We've been working with them about four years. Um, they are funding evidence-based solutions, and they're not just funding them. They have a $160 million fund. 60% of that is for demand dementia-related innovation. So they've got this fund. They also have um, people like John Reinhardt and Joy Tolliver and others who coach you on the commercialization of your business. So it used to be that people got funding as an academic in a university and then went out to think about building a business. Now what you have are entrepreneurs who are building businesses, finding research partners through different universities like Hopkins or Brown or Illinois. And then um, that combination of the research efficacy and knowledge combined with the entrepreneur and the, the talents of those teams and investors is pure magic. So we must have six clients that are NIA funded. And I, I, they told me that 20% uh, of my client base um, we asked at a party, we said everyone who is uh, funded by the NIA and the line was very, very long of people that came up, but it's, it's a brilliant thing to do as part of your roadmap for your business. You should have uh, come to the conferences where we showcase how to get NIA funding. And, the, and I expect that to be just incredibly important in the future too. What are you seeing? What are you excited about in terms of Alzheimer's innovation? Maybe something came up at the recent summit that you hosted. That, and also I judged the international competition in the UK last week. So I saw the top 24 plans and initiatives. Um, so we're seeing AI infused innovation. We're seeing lighting, hearing, um, co-creation, um, and um, I don't think we have seen, we're seeing mobile solutions, but I think we have a long way to go to, to reach that moonshot around dementia. And um, we're seeing solutions for wanderment and things like that. Posit Science has done extremely well over the last 21 years. They now are a preferred partner of the military for cognitive fitness. Um, Brain, with their brain HQ, but um, it's a great place to innovate in. And I don't think we've seen enough. I once saw the Philips Home in the Future in Eindhoven, and I know that lighting was a big part of it. I don't think we've seen enough of the holistic home and the way in which that could make a difference in someone's life. The money is following in different pockets of the world too. So we always are I collect investors like other people collect baseball cards. You know, I have always looking for, in fact, I was very excited to have the, we had a win winner from our competition come back as an investor to our conference with over 35 investors, but like um, angel investors, um, people who might be in a family office that um, had an experienced a family member with dementia, and now they want to earmark that funding. So I see a convergence of foundations that want to be more innovative around investment and uh, philanthropies that want to be more innovative around investing. So we're looking at those different things. And also an, a really big sweet spot in the market is the Forgotten Middle Scan Foundation is doing a great job here, along with Adamika Arthur at Healthcare for Medicaid and Seven Wire Ventures. So you're beginning to see these new alignments where you've got the new rules around Medicaid, and that's a money that's going to be guaranteed, hopefully. And then you have the investors that know that money is guaranteed, know that reimbursement. So along with my seven rules, I would say in my mini masterclass on longevity, I would say you need a B2B strategy, a B2C strategy, a B2 digital strategy. And then you also need a B to 
understanding reimbursement strategy. So mm -hmm. it's sort of like if you follow the money and you know that the money is flowing in this direction through this group, that's where the innovation can happen. Because some counties in California have two and a half million dollars to invest in uh, innovation and technology. And that's at the local level to spend. So you want to get involved in some of those different planning groups. Home care and PTs and OTs are always looking for incremental revenue that they can use to support their business. So can you create a device? We're working with a company right now called Accelera that has a device that helps with balance. It's spun out of Harvard. Um, and I know it works because a couple people close to me have, are liking it, the product. But I could see that that's an add-on service that can fit right into a PT or an OT solution. And, you know, um, so what's exciting about the market is the intellectual candle power of the people, the founders, the investors are the best you can find. The compassion and the care and the connection and the collaboration is the best. And so it's sort of like the best of times. In fact, I think I was quoted yesterday by someone who was telling me how much they like their job at 63 and how they want to keep investing and inventing in this market. And I think he was saying he talked to someone who was even older. I think that might have been me. So when people say, Mary, you really should retire, I think, well, why would I retire from a market where our knowledge is so relevant today and so accretive and growing. But it doesn't mean that I won't bring in someone else to help me along the way. I love it. You know, I'm sure, Mary, as you're talking about collecting investors, the folks on the call who are in this market can't help but be wondering, how do I, how do I connect with that right fit funder? We talk a lot about finding the mission aligned funder, maybe that angel or the you know family office who has had a family member um, dealing with the thing that you're solving. Um, I know you host events and that's part of the strategy. How can startups be smarter about meeting the right types of funders? Yeah, that's that's really the key question you want to ask because you don't want to meet the wrong type. And I've I've known both, and I've had the privilege of working with the best, and I've also had the challenge of working with ones that are difficult. And I more than that, I've seen other founders go through hell really when they've got the wrong person around the table. Um, I like strategic investors. I, I like uh, nonprofit investor groups. And I like angels that have um, a desire not to find a second job through your company, but can add value through their connections or can add value through their resources and their willingness to listen. So, you know, I'm not trying to plug my consulting, but that's essentially what we what we do is try to facilitate that match. But there are also groups like Anu Shukala, who's had two exits at 400 million and is part of the Indian entrepreneur group. Um, Anu invests only in um, women and minorities. And so you've got to find the right match with the right group. If they, if you fit into that category, that's, that's great. Um, but also you can look locally. I, I never knew how many wealthy people there were in Nashville, Tennessee. Well, they're all retired in the zip code right around um, Nashville. So I had a co entrepreneur that was there and explained that economics of Nashville, Tennessee to me. And so now I just sent an entrepreneur to meet with someone in Nashville today because there are a lot of people who understand healthcare and want to invest in something they know about. Most people don't want to invest in something they don't know anything about. Yeah. I love your approach, Mary. It's like if if your first strategy, your second strategy isn't working, guess what? There's eight more things you can try, including uh, finding out where the wealthy people live in your, in your town um, and making something happen on the ground. Let's talk about pilots. I talked to so many founders that uh, in the senior care space who feel like they just need to score that one pilot, the perfect pilot, and if they can get in and prove their benefit, then they'll be they'll be made. They'll be able to scale up, and everyone will will get what they're doing. Um, what are your thoughts about what you've seen work in terms of pilots? 
um, when people are, are scaling up products in the market? So we have a couple of entrepreneurs that we work with very strong. The number one skill you need as an entrepreneur is tenacity. So that has to be part of your mix in the morning is that you have that tenacity. But um, I, so very talented entrepreneurs who listen well, actually like the people they're doing the pilots with, support the staff in different ways. And then sometimes it just doesn't work out, even though they've done everything right. What you have to find is the Carrie Olson's of the world, the front porches, where she cares about innovation and entrepreneurship. She wants to pilot. Or Michael Hughes, we just sent one to him, was willing to take the call and listen. Um, but I've increasingly been less sanguine on pilots as I am in getting the word out and just building that customer base. So there was an entrepreneur that came to our conference from Japan. He got a uh, 45 seconds to pitch. He was hosting a lunch table and he, and he got in, people invited to see his demo, but it's a, it's a tool that helps increase the sound on your television, which I think a lot of fights in America happened because the sound is way up with one person who can't hear, you know, um, by joke that hearing loss is saving marriages all over. But anyway, so his device is gonna help with this problem. Well, he's already got 60,000 in sales um, by direct to consumer sales. So nothing better than getting pre-orders for your product. If you have the right product, you're gonna sell out with the customer. So I almost think a pilot can be informative, but I wouldn't, I would be, I, you know, when I go to the horse races, I go win, place, and show on my friend's horse. So I wouldn't put all my chips down on the win for the pilot. I would diversify my, um, my, you know, I would diversify right from the beginning. So if you take a look at prostate cancer and you look at the number of men with prostate cancer in this country and the kinds of side effects they have, and you look at um, some of the innovations, like uh, Joe and Bella have a product that can help um, with some of these incontinence issues. Most of the media that cover aging don't cover the dissidences, but they have this great aspirational product that's a very good solution. And so if you take a look at Journey Health and Wellness's website and just see how they market products, these are pretty educated consumers. I would just get the product out in as many channels as I could and watch the numbers and watch what happens. You know, that reminds me of a question that I had for you about being in the right rooms. You talk about really um, having a flashpoint moment where people really get what you're doing and it catches on. There's certain events. It's such a multifaceted industry that it can probably be hard for a founder to know where should I be to be in the right room to sort of share my vision with the right people. So obviously you've got your summit, but help us under, help a founder understand how to prioritize where to be. Yes, because it's frustrating when you see how much budget money gets spent on travel and and how hard it is to know what to do. Um, you just mentioned the guy who got 45 seconds after right. traveling from Japan. You know, you really have to prioritize. But I'm committed to helping him now because I'm not going to let him fail. It was worth it. So that. it was worth but it. Also, I believed in his product, right? So <laughs> we're we're going to make sure. But, but you know, when he came, it gave me an idea. I have a marketplace on my website. I want to build out my marketplace more to show other people's innovations. But I think look for marketplaces and other places you could be listed, even at the local level, um, to know where to go. So who would have thought you should go to Washington in August after being in Florida in July, right? But the, the conference with all the state governments is in July now, I mean, it's in August in Washington. I'm not going to that, but I am going to the Ziegler conference in Chicago with their portfolio companies. And I never miss that conference, not only because Dan Herman throws a great party on the rooftop, but I use it to have a meeting of my clients in Chicago the day before. So I find um, piggybacking on other people's meetings and seeing what's there and regional often works, you know, 
So you don't necessarily need to go to the national, but you need to go where the money is. So if the money is in the state budgets and some of these area agencies on aging, you need to get into those places. And even your local Aging 2.0 chapters that are still around, or some of these new chapters like in, uh, in Atlanta. And of course, I can't say enough with the HTEC Collaborative, and they have 600 companies now in the HTEC Collaborative. So that's a great place to network in. And they did a great job at CES in Vegas. I did a podcast from there this year. But, you know, if you went to the leading age of your state conference and you got traction in leading age there, that would be fine, you know. Um, how should startups think about their strategy with the VA? Uh, there's so many health issues um, facing our veteran population um, and there's startups in this space who maybe don't even have a VA strategy yet. So how should they be thinking about it? Yes, that's my uh, fall learning curriculum. I'm going to learn more about that. You know, we worked with a company called Button Helper. Um, he sold he, buttons that came off very easily. He sold that into the VA, and his name is Robert Bolin. He's 25 years old, I think. Um, he had advisors that were from the military and recently sold his company to... Um, to um, the Smithsonian, but Blue Star, I think, is another company we work with. Um, Robert Ray, who knows how you know you could pitch it to him and then see where's it, where it goes. But um, I think I, I've had two clients be extraordinarily successful with the VA, and um, it's often either an advisor who knows that ecosystem well, but. Um, there's going to be more and more interest and programming, I think, about VA solutions, even your local VA, you know, but absolutely that should be part of your strategy. Robert Bolin wrote a 40 page guide for one of my other clients on how to go to market with the VA that will feature in December. But it's clearly something we have to learn about. See, I don't know if it was Shark Tank or your work at Startup Health, but somebody has told everybody that they need to be innovative. And so companies that you wouldn't expect to be innovative before now are more willing to innovate. But it's how do you get it into the whole system? That's the challenge. Just given your 30,000 foot view of the market, given your experience, um, any thoughts on kind of what's next? What should we be looking forward to 12 months from now? What are we on the cusp of in terms of trends versus versus what you're seeing at the moment? What's next? So what I would say, uh, I have to quote Ken Dykewald um, of AgeWave, you know, if you want to catch an elephant, dig a big hole where they're going. So if you looked, if it takes seven years to build a business and you looked at the boomers at 80 in 16 months, I would find out everything I could about the 85 to 87 year old. And then I would design for that and I'd roll back from there on building the business. Mm -hmm. And that might be travel on cruises with assistive mobility devices. It's just truly understanding the customer. You can never go wrong when you understand your customer. And the customer, 100 million people have arthritis. It isn't fun. And so now uh, we should have a whole line of products that are around that topic. You know, I thought I was in high school when I went to water aerobics on Sunday. Found out everybody in the class has some kind of PT. So if you know that at 75 they've got this, what are they going to have at 85? Mm. And so we have a client in in. England, who wants to build warm water swimming pools inside senior living. That is on my wish list to get funded this year. Yes. And because I think every, you have to drive 30 miles to get to one water aerobics class with PT. So mm. nobody's connecting the dots on those kinds of things. Um, we, we talk in startups so much about metaphorical pain points to solve. And you're just saying like, there are these very obvious physical pain points, the the arthritis, the these challenges that that people want to solve today, um, and and the need is pressing. 
yeah, here's what I, my last advice, we love to go to happy hour. So just host a happy hour for all the 80 year olds in your community. Trust me, they'll come, they'll give you all their advice. They'll be your lobbyist to pilot. It, I love it. it. Fun. Make it fun. Mary, you've given us like 25 creative solutions. And I love that. Thank you so much for taking time with us. Uh, I learned so much. It wasn't so much the specific solutions. It was just this overwhelming sense of getting creative, thinking beyond your, your typical mental barriers of what you think is possible and get it done. There are opportunities. Uh, there's riches in the niches. There's opportunities everywhere, whether it's your local library, the county government, the YMCA. You really got my mind going. And so thanks for the inspiration, Mary. Thanks for the work that you do and for taking time with us today. I don't know if you have just one, any last, any last word, I'll give it to you. Remember that older people, myself included, want a vision of the future, not a memory of the past. That's the only line that got a standing ovation at the White House Conference on Aging. And this week, we've really taken aging and really given it a bad name, it, 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 it really. And so to the extent that we can reinstantiate the role of older people as role models, as mentors, as leaders, as friends, that's what we want to do. I love it, Mary. Beautiful note to end on. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. Sorry. Okay, bye-bye, everyone.